everybody. Uh, welcome to Not Being Governed on the Voluntary Virtues Network uh, every Sunday from 3 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm your host, Daniel Hawkins. Uh, this is the fourth episode. Uh, I apologize to everybody for the uh, technical problems I had for the last uh, week. Um, this should be the fifth episode, but uh, I had some problems with uh, uploading the video. So this is episode four. Uh, last time I talked about um, the Iraq and Syria situation, uh, all that, um, and this episode, uh, I will not be talking about Hobby Lobby, I'm sure everyone is talking about Hobby Lobby, you've probably heard everyone that you've ever come into contact to, at some point, talk about Hobby Lobby, and you can probably guess my opinion on Hobby Lobby and the ruling and everything, uh, and the opinion of pretty much every other libertarian, except for bleeding heart libertarians, I guess. Uh, they have a different opinion. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, secession movements. Um, this is kind of old news in a way, uh, but in a way it's also not. Um, but, you know, the last few episodes have been kind of like about grim topics, so uh, I think now's a good time to talk about something a little bit more optimistic, a little bit happier, uh, especially as it relates to um, libertarianism and uh, volunteerism and stuff. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so let's talk about California. I'm sure you guys have probably heard about uh, how there was a proposal to... Um, split California into several states, uh, one of them being Northern California, having it called the state of Jefferson, and it turns out that because they're not very liberal or, uh, and, and they don't want the tax burden that Southern California has, a lot of Northern Californians did like the idea. A lot of even uh, libertarians have been involved in the creation or, you know, the hope that that Jefferson can secede from California, um, so that is problematic in a way that I'll cover later. Um, but but I mean, it looks fairly hopeful. But there was a vote recently. Let's see when this article is from. Uh, so this is the fourth of June, so pretty pretty, you know, recent news. There was a referendum, I think, about breaking away in California, and it turned out that it was defeated. But this Huffington Post article, uh, and I'll link to it um, in the description, it was going to be Siskiyou County to rename Republic of Jefferson. It says, failed with only 44% of voters in favor. All right, so it was defeated by 59%. Or something like that. No, no. Okay, this is talking about several other referendums when they're talking about different counties calling itself that. Okay, but it was it said it was it was only supported by 44%. Only 44%. So, let's talk about that for a second. The secession movements in the United States especially have never really been popular, at least not since the Civil War. Um even when uh, John C. Calhoun um, and everyone like that was were proposing secession even before the Civil War, it was still an unpopular sentiment. Um, since the forming of the Constitution, secession has been kind of frowned upon. Uh, and we should also note that according to the Constitution, it is unconstitutional for states to form alliances and to break away from the Union. Um, so... This is kind of historical for, you know, or this is historic for the United States because people are finally supporting the idea of secession where they really hadn't before. And there have been secession movements in like Wyoming, Texas, of course, um, New Hampshire and Vermont, especially Vermont is like, you know, the standard for secession movements in the U.S. Um, but there are secession movements in Washington State or secession movements 
in parts of Florida, uh, pretty much all over the place. Uh, so there have been, there's been a lot of support for this, but it says only 44%. And it's kind of ridiculous that they say only 44% because I guarantee you that 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it would nowhere near be 44% in favor of breaking away from California and forming a new state. There's no possible way that it would ever be that popular before now because we've, we're in the situation now where secession to a lot of people seems like the only viable option. Um, so I, I just want to make that clear that it's not only 44%. This is incredible. I'd be surprised if it was 20%. I'd be surprised if it was 15% in favor of secession. Think about how, how small the libertarian vote is for the libertarian party in general elections. You know, lucky if they get like 10%. Lucky if they get like 5%. So for 44% to be in favor of seceding from California and forming a 51st state, that's incredible. Um... And there have been, all around the world, a lot of really popular secession movements. And I don't want to say that these this is kind of a new thing, but the popularity of these movements is definitely growing. Um, obviously, we have Ukraine um, vying for more economic independence from Russia and moving toward the European Union. I wouldn't exactly say that's secession, but then you have... Uh, the Crimea and uh, the eastern uh, provinces of Ukraine breaking away and then joining Russia. I wouldn't exactly say that's exactly secession either, but um, there were independence movements, I guess. Um, so now we've definitely got, you've probably heard about the Venetian secession movement. Um, something interesting about that is it, it it's actually very similar to the United States, I would say, uh, in that Italy and Germany and some other European countries, but Italy and Germany are very good examples, uh, until the mid-19th century. So up until the time that we had, the United States had civil war, Italy and Germany were broken into small countries. In Italy, you had like the papal states, and you had basically a lot of the provinces or states that they have now used to be their own countries, and they were united um, under uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi, um, I think in the 1860s or 1870s, um, and then Germany uh, was united um, mostly under Bismarck. Um, Germany was united, was united around the same time. So these two countries that we now th that we've always pretty much thought and we do think now of as just you know homogenous entities, you know, cohesive uh unions were not actually that way until fairly recently. I mean, yeah, the civil war doesn't seem very recent to us, but it is really pretty recent. Um, so that's pretty incredible. Now, Venice wants to secede. They see the economic state of affairs in Italy, Italy being on the verge of a Greece type of situation. They've never been exactly very well off in Italy. Um, income inequality, big deal there. The welfare state is pretty much insolvent there. Um, of course, they joined the Eurozone, um, somewhat recently which did help with their currency, but now they're trying to ask the EU for basically a bailout. Um, it doesn't look like it's coming because austerity measures are kind of going against that. Um, so they're, they're in a difficult place right now. Um, so Venice, there are people who want to create something called the Nation of Veneto, um, so they want to break away from Italy, form their own autonomous uh, country. I don't know if they want to be part of the Eurozone or if they want to be part of the European Union or what. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But they do want to break away because they realize now that Italy is 
not in a great place and they don't want to be dragged down with it. And the popularity of this is incredible. The referendums have been defeated. Uh, you know, the government in Rome has been saying that they will send in troops and, and uh, basically their version of the National Guard into Venice to crush what they view as an extremist uh, fringe, um, and there are many of them in Europe, so they just view it as another extremist fringe that needs to be crushed in the name of Italian nationalism, which is huge. Nationalism in Italy is extremely popular, and it has been since their unification. Um, same in Germany. Unification, it's a big thing. They celebrate it. We celebrate our Independence Day. They celebrate Unification Day. Um, and they do treat it like we treat the 4th of July. So, uh, Germany doesn't seem... There is a Bavarian independence movement. Uh, they're very popular. And there are independence movements among some city-states that they have. Um, but overall, it's not quite as popular as Venetian independence is in Italy. Um, so, it is, it is getting more and more popular, though. I mean, not very long ago, this would have just been laughed out of existence. So... I think that is pretty heartening as far as the spirit of independence goes. And then we've also got uh, Scottish secession, you know, you got the SNP. That, if you haven't heard about it, is more popular than it's ever been. And a lot of people working towards Scot Scottish independence are very happy about that. Look, they've been fighting for independence in Scotland for a very, very long time. Um... And the concept of Great Britain and the concept of the United Kingdom came about out of sheer force and violence. There was no real, you know, referendum. There was no real, you know, uh, right that the UK, that England had to take over Scotland. And then before that, it had no real right to take over Wales. And then now, you know, there's the occupation of Northern Ireland, and some people want to be part of the UK, and some people don't want it to be part of the UK. Very violent situation, you know, in Northern Ireland especially. But so now you have Scottish independence movements going on, and it's huge. It's huge. Um, a lot of the country does support independence, but there's also economic unsurety. Some of them want to break away from the UK because they want to be more, they want to be closer to the European Union, but they also want to retain some independence, and the oil uh, that's produced in the North Sea, and uh, Glasgow is a huge oil producer, huge oil producer, um, they, they think that will basically be their powerhouse, and it, it would be if they broke away, but some people think they wouldn't be strong enough. And some people are just loyalists. They, they, um, especially Anglican Scots, uh, as opposed to Catholic Scots, a lot of them want to stay part of the UK. And this is splitting them apart pretty badly, but independence is, the spirit of independence is rising. You know, you guys have probably seen Braveheart. Uh, most recently, the last kind of bout of the independence movement was the, uh, Jacobite Rebellion, um, in the 1700s at some point, a uh, very strong um, spirit of independence in Scotland. They used to have a separate language. You know, they have a history of just England repressing them, and they know that. Uh, and while England does present a lot of security for them, the Scots have kind of viewed it as, we've been fighting and we've had people die for this cause. They've died for it. So, you know, uh, it, it's no surprise that a lot of people do support it. Um, and the Irish obviously fought for their independence, and they won. And obviously there were a lot of violent after effects, but it is possible. Um, and the United States obviously declared secession from uh, Great Britain and won. So, uh, but now, speaking of the United States you have also unintended consequences, or I guess some of them might not be unintended. Um, 
I would encourage anybody, I'm going to do a shameless plug here, to read, go to uh, notbeinggoverned.com and check out uh, my article called Freedom is Unconstitutional, if you haven't read it already. And you can read up on, you don't have to read all of it, obviously, uh, but you can read up on the effects of independence that the United States had, and it really was not independence, because as soon as they broke away, as the states individually broke away from England, it became about creating a new government. And then they wanted a new government to govern all 13 states. So whatever, you know, ghost of freedom that was there was gone by 1787 and definitely by the 1790s. So pretty much a tragic situation, especially for uh, Pennsylvania, who had been essentially operating in an anarchist society with not a functioning government to speak of. Uh, their state legislature didn't really exist. They only existed really on paper, and they were not enforceable. No one paid taxes. It was, yeah, anarchy for more than like a hundred years, basically. Um, but then the National Bank was established, and they lost that independence, and the Constitution was established. So it was essentially a robbery on part of the Federalists and the Annapolis Convention, which then called for the Philadelphia Convention or the Constitutional Convention. Uh, the Annapolis Convention, at that, um, not that many people showed up to that even, and then Alexander Hamilton said, hey, let's convene in Philadelphia. And then it was really a, uh, an underhanded attempt to force the anti-Federalist members of you know, the anti-federalist politicians out of the game and say, this is how we're going to set things up. We don't want them a part of it. But they ended up kind of, you know, gumming up the works later on with the Bill of Rights. So anyway, the point is that there was no real independence after it because someone created another state that governed all the 13 states, which used to be actual, like, states with a capital S, used to be their own autonomous governments, but then there was a federal government that, you know, obviously supersedes them now. Um, and in Scotland, uh, a lot of people are talking about, look, libertarians, we want to be sympathetic toward Scottish independence, but at the same time, the SNP is very socialist-leaning. They definitely want a stronger welfare, welfare state for Scotland. Um, you know, in the end, it's still going to be pretty much pointless. They will still be governed. There won't actually be independence. Um, and this is different than some other secession movements, um, talking about a lot of uh, Native American tribes over the years trying to secede, um, some of them not really having centralized forms of government, um, and different movements throughout history. Uh, obviously, there was um, Neutral Moresnet, which didn't secede. It was created really on accident as a DMZ, but people live there, um, which DMZs they're usually unpopulated for a reason, but it was populated, and then it became its own separate country, and they fought, basically, I mean, through diplomacy and trade, but they did vie for their independence without a government. Excuse me. And uh, I don't think that any of these movements are anything like that. And as far as their leaders go, they want to become, in. they want to be in charge when these places declare independence. That's the problem. Throughout history, every time someone has trying to th tried to throw over a dic overthrow a dictator or to overthrow just to, just a government they don't want, um, they rely on these popular uprisings. And you know, France is a really good example of that. Um, but there are tons of other great examples where 
there is somebody or a group of people who would find it in their interest to play off the spirit of independence. And they may even genuinely believe in it. And then once that independence is gained, they're like, okay, because you guys trusted me to make decisions during our independence movement, I'm going to be the one who makes all the decisions when we're independent from this guy or this this country or whatever. Or, uh, you know, during our rebellion and we've overthrown the old government, now I'm going to become the new leader or whatever. And a lot of times it's under the guise of democracy and they're like, oh, Oh, so now we've gotten rid of the monarchy, and now we have democracy, but guess what? Uh, I'm going to be the president, or I'm going to be, you know, the prime minister, or, you know, my party will become the dominant party in the parliament. And this has happened over and over and over and over and over. That type of freedom uh, isn't really freedom. And we know that... uh, Because they're just creating another government. They're not, you know, some some people talk about, oh, well, there's a power vacuum. We're afraid of this power vacuum, and oh, no. So here's a really good quote to kind of, you know, bring that up. If if someone talks about, oh, the power vacuum, I would say this quote, and this is one of my favorite quotes of anyone ever. Um, Marie Rothbard, uh, I don't know in what book he says it or if it was just an interview or something, but he says, once one concedes that a single world government is not necessary, then where does one logically stop at the permissibility of separate states? If Canada and the United States can be separate nations without being denounced as in a state of impermissible anarchy, why may not the South secede from the United States? New York State from the Union, and this is where a lot of people start to disagree, New York City from the state. Why may not Manhattan secede? Each neighborhood, each block, each house, each person. That really, I have to say, was one of the sentiments that really brought me away from minarchism, from constitutionalism. It's realizing that you are oppressing people who want to secede. If they want to break away, then it would be oppression to not let them. And when you do break away, or if you do break away, or if you do replace the, or, you know, get rid of the old government, don't replace it with anything that is not freedom. That's just substituting one tyrant for another. And it doesn't matter if the new guy seems nicer. It doesn't matter if the new guy, um, you know, has a bunch of promises. Every tyrant has made promises to people. That's how they, they operate. Read The Prince by Machiavelli. He doesn't talk about being a jerk to everyone all the time. He says, you know, be careful about who you... You know, he, he says, be popular, be tough on your people, but be popular. Because every government knows that it's basically walking on eggshells all the time. Government is oppression, and somewhere they know that. But they need to be discreet enough with their oppression that they don't get overthrown. But they still want to do what they want to do, which is governing people forcing them to do, to bend to their will. So, replacing them is not going to work. And I'm finding a quote right now. No, I can't find it right now. But anyway, uh, it was a, it was a quote by uh, one of, these people who was a uh, part of the Enrages movement in the French Revolution, uh, who, and they're, and basically they were anarchists. Um, When the French Revolution was over, uh, there was essentially a dictatorship installed. uh, And it kind of ran over all of the 
principles that the French revolutionaries said they wanted to uphold, um, one of them being liberty. But the enragés, who were very much anti-government, said that revolutionary government is a contradiction in terms. And there was this guy, I can't find the quote, but he was one of the leaders who said, and I'm paraphrasing, you cannot have a successful revolution when you replace the old political leaders with new ones. And I think that's extremely succinct. I'm sorry about the noise, by the way, if you can hear it. Um, but it's extremely succinct and it's extremely, you know, poignant. And we should all take it to heart when we're talking about secession. You cannot really have truly libertarian secession. You cannot have freedom in secession if you're just replacing the old government with a new one or, you know, a, a, a libertarian revolution. And when we're talking about solutions for starting a libertarian or, you know, a voluntary society, and I want to make this clear, and I'll, I'll probably make another video about it eventually, uh, but when they're talking about solutions, you know, hey, maybe we should uh, just start a revolution and see how many people join us, and then, you know, there might be violence, but so be it, and, you know, uh, that itself I have a problem with because then you are aggressing against the people, misguided as they may be, who support the status quo. And you cannot trample on those people who support the status quo, even though you think they're wrong. That's the problem. You cannot just, you can't call yourself a libertarian and call yourself a voluntarist and rob people of their misguided but voluntary support for government. And I think the only way to reconcile voluntarist values or, you know, that kind of thing, is to secede or start some sort of independence movement, be it, you know, in Somalia, like, check out the Free Somalia Project. Um, I'm one of the admins on the Facebook page. It's a fantastic page. They have great ideas. I think it's an extremely worthy pursuit. Somalia is not that scary, you know. Anyway, uh, Somalia, and it might be, you know, uh, the Free Island Project, it might be some sort of, you know, other seasteading type thing, or it might be a secession movement right here in the United States. That is okay, because then you can gather people, and, you know, I wrote about Josiah Warren who did this with pretty good success for a while. You gather people together who, are, who want the same thing, who don't want government, who are volunteers, buy a piece of land, or do something like that, you know. That make sure everyone there agrees that they don't want a government and that you're not violating their rights and their desires by imposing your views on them. You want to make sure that they, you know, and we say it over and over again, plenty of ar anarchist arguments and books and, you know, videos, they should be free to form their own government if they want to. But if you start this revolution and you make it a violent rebellion, you start to aggress against those people who, yes, are misguided and wrong and do want to hurt you in some way through government. They don't necessarily know that, though. So we should all keep in mind that you are not being a volunteerist when you advocate violently overthrowing a government that some people really do want. The only correct and only really just way to go about it, if you want to be consistent with your volunteerist beliefs, is to secede, but don't replace it with anything. And that's the only way secession will ever be uh, successful. And it won't be oppressive or repressive. So uh, I hope this was a good video. I hope you guys uh, learned something from it. As always, uh, check out Turncoat Resource. Check out Art of Not Being Governed. Um, like I said, Free Somalia Project. It's pretty awesome. Uh, have a good um, Dependence on Government Day. Have a good uh, Nationalism Day. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next week.